All right, so we're about to listen to the International Space Station communicate with a school in Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell where there was an alleged uh, alien uh, UFO crash. And it's starting really soon. So I'm gonna go ahead and get set up right here and I'll explain what happened after it happens. So thanks for watching. being away for a long time, uh, but it, uh, it fails in comparison to, you know, what our soldiers are doing overseas uh, on their long deployments. So I feel uh, pretty thankful and blessed to, to have this opportunity. Over. Okay, the next question is, in case of an emergency, how is the evacuation process executed? The last one was about being homesick. How do you deal with that? Oh, that's a great question, and, and it's a... Um, and so I feel fortunate to be up here. My background is as an emergency medicine doctor, and so if, uh, if anyone had a, an injury or an illness, I would uh, work with the folks on the ground to, to treat one of my, my crew members. Um, we receive, everybody receives a little bit of medical training on our procedures and equipment, and, uh, and anything beyond that, uh, if we had a significant emergency, um, we could always jump into our, our Soyuz spacecraft and return to the Earth. Over. It's like that was actually, if an astronaut experiences an open flesh wound or medical emergency in space, then how are these injuries treated? Next, since the Curiosity rover has gone to Mars and the next step would be to colonize Mars, how do you think the travel through space would affect the astronauts both physically and mentally? This is question nine. Well, that's a big part of what we're, uh, what we're learning on the International Space Station right now. With uh, my long duration mission and, and uh, Scott Kelly's year long missions, we're learning about how uh, long durations in space uh, affect uh, the human body. And so we have countermeasures like exercise to, to uh, help both the physical and mental aspects of being in space for a long time. Over. Question, that was question 9 of 24. Here is question 10 of 24. Is it possible to create artificial gravity in space? If it can be made, then why isn't it used on the ISS? I'm sorry, I missed, uh, I missed that one. Can you repeat that, please? Is it possible to create artificial gravity in space? If it can be made, and why isn't it used on the ISS? Hey, thanks for that question. Yeah, it is that's absolutely um, possible to create artificial gravity. If you've ever seen the movie 2001 with the kind of large spinning uh, donut-shaped space station, you can do that with, uh, with kind of an inertial force. Um, the, the truth is, is that there's some difficult engineering there. It's certainly not insurmountable, but uh, at this point um, we are using we're not using that uh, to create artificial gravity. You know, if we do long duration spaceflight and decide that the safest way to do that to keep people healthy is to create artificial gravity, then we may go in that direction. But right now, uh, we, we go without. Over. That next question is 11. Has NASA come up with any solution to the negative effects of long term spaceflight on astronauts? Thank you for that question, and that again is a big part of what we're studying on on the space station is how to counteract those negative effects of long duration space flight by doing um, weightlifting exercises, by running and uh, using the exercise bike. We can uh, maintain our cardiovascular, musculoskeletal fitness, um, and uh, and those go a long way until keeping us healthy uh, until we return to the Earth. Over. About. We're at max elevation right now, seven degrees, a little bit past it actually. Well, and I'm, I'm very thankful that they did. Uh, it, it gave me the, the opportunity to be able to do this. Um, you know, we started using test pilots initially because uh, the vehicles were very experimental. And, and so the, they brought in people with the skills that were necessary uh, to do those types of missions. As we um, established that we could uh, get to space efficiently, we, we decided that we really wanted to utilize that capability and uh, conduct science in space. And so the first non-scientists or non-pilots to fly were during the Apollo program 
a geologist, uh, Harrison Schmidt, who went to the moon. And subsequently, we've had physicians and uh, engineers and all sorts of other folks up into space to really uh, utilize this uh, capability of studying, doing work, and research in space. Over. Okay, that was, why did NASA transition from astronauts being former pilots to a more diverse community? Next is, are you able to see a difference in the color or in the currents of the Pacific Ocean due to the changes in water temperature caused by seeing, caused by such things? Hey, thank you for that question. Um, one you. of my favorite things is to look out the window at the Earth, and, and when you do, almost invariably, you see the ocean. Um, I have not been able to detect any differences in color due to uh, changes in currents, however. Thank you. Over. What is the coolest thing you've ever seen up there? Having some problems. In 5 MMI, this is one FF. Have you copied? What is the coolest thing you've ever seen up there? This is almost over for me. Yeah, looks like they lost it. That's too bad. Let's see, the pass was supposed to end for them at 12.02.03, so yeah, that kind of makes sense. Okay. We just listened to astronaut Kel Lindengren communicating, or Lindgren, communicating with a school in New Mexico, Roswell, New Mexico, the New Mexico Military Institute. And we got about maybe 40% uh, of them, I would say, 40% of the questions. And they did not complete all their questions. So um, it's, uh, it happens sometimes. So the pass, one of the reasons I wanted to do this pass is because I've done Western passes before. I've done, I've listened to some where they were, uh, where the ISS was going over Arizona, and that was very far away. And um, I actually drove to the mountains to listen to it. Um, I'm in uh, the Piedmont, the central part of North Carolina, and I drove west to the Appalachian Mountains on the Blue Ridge Parkway and tried to receive um, a pass that was near overhead for Arizona. And I didn't get much of it. So this pass was with New Mexico, and it wasn't overhead for New Mexico. It was actually further west. So it was a 41 degree pass for them. Um, overhead would be 90 degrees. And so for me, it was still only seven degrees, but it was closer. So I wanted to give that a shot. It was closer and the, um, the pass over, the time that it, the passes overlapped was longer. I'll show you what I mean. So here are the pass details. This is Roswell, New Mexico. You can see it started at 11.51.09, and our pass started at 11.55.56. So about four or five minutes um, overlap from, from their pass to my pass. And then of course, I wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to communicate through my whole pass because you can see it ends at 12.02, which is before when it ended for me. And that's probably why they, uh, um, Kel, the astronaut, lost communication with with the school. It, the pass just ended. It went below zero degrees. So yeah, 45 degrees, approximately 41, what I said earlier. And for us, you can see it was seven degrees. Okay, so... So I wanted to see... Another thing I wanted to see is if I could receive it well. I guess I mentioned that, that it was really weak when I did the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway pass. And, and also, I've done a lot of passes where Russian uh, cosmonauts were communicating with schools. Um, several months ago, there were no U.S. astronauts on board that had ham licenses. And so the Russians take over for that, for the U.S. context. And, and they have two stations up there. They have a station in the Zara module, or the, the, yeah, the Russian service module. And that station is what the Russians use, and it's more powerful. And it has a different antenna, I believe. Yeah, it definitely does. It has a different antenna, and it's more powerful. It's 25 watts compared to the one that the U.S. and the Europeans, and I guess the Japanese use in the Columbus module. It's only five watts, so, and it has a different antenna. And the Columbus module, so because of the power and maybe the antenna and the location of the antenna, uh, it's harder to receive ISS um, communications via those, via the Columbus module than um, 
via the radio in the Columbus module versus the radio in the uh, Russian service module. So I wanted to see if I could get that really well, even though it was a low pass, and I did. And sometimes I think you can't, depending on geometry. I've, um, I did another pass in the beginning of the summer where the ISS was going over um, a telebridge station in, in Maryland. And a, a telebridge station is a station that receives the radio signals and transmits the radio signals to the ISS and then relays them via telephone to a school or an organization that's actually um, communicating ultimately with their, um, you know, talking through the phone line then up to the radio. So, so I received that in North Carolina and it was, um, it was the ISS was a, had a better pass over Maryland than North Carolina if I remember correctly, but I received the signal better than they did in Maryland. And, and somebody that works with the organization that does all this International Space Station amateur radio stuff, uh, it's actually called Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, ARIS. They uh, emailed me and saw this and they said that, you know, they emailed me when they saw my video of it and said, wow, it was more, you had a better signal than we did in, um, in Maryland. And he's, he mentioned that for the Columbus module, it's all about, it's all about geometry. So anyway, that's, I don't know how, exactly how it's about ge geometry, but it, it, you can see that if you're in a different location based on where it is, it would be different geometry. So that seems to be their, um, their theory on that. So yeah, and when I'm, the Russians do their transmissions, it can be really low and really far away, and you get the signal like close to full scale on the signal strength meter. You get almost all of the signal of the bars, you know, like on your phone lit up. And and with the Columbus module, it has to be pretty much overhead to get a full signal. I don't think I've ever gotten a full signal from it. Granted, I don't know if I've ever gotten it overhead, but yeah, so that's a uh, that's that's all the reasons and that's all the things that are in play here that I wanted to try out and experiment with. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, I'll show you a little the setup real quickly. Okay, most important part of an amateur radio setup is the antenna, and this is my antenna. It's an Arrow 2 satellite antenna, and it's set up for two meters. These are two meter elements, but it also has elements that you can screw in in each of these holes to work on 70 centimeters, and. And then I have the radio over here. And the radio is a simple um, two meter mobile um, FM. And you can see it's tuned to 145.8 megahertz. And that is the downlink for the International Space Station. And there's a public uplink, 144.49 for the region we're in. It's different depending on the part of the world you're in. And I wouldn't be able to communicate with them or interfere with them because they use private um, confidential uplinks, uh, the schools do, for these scheduled contacts to avoid unintentional interference, intentional or otherwise. Um, so that's, that's that. Let's see, what else, what else? Okay, so yeah, you saw my, my past details. Um, I printed out the, the questions on this uh, piece of paper and then, you know, taped it to a board so it would be stop solid. Um, here's my compass that I use to figure out the direction of the pass. You can see, or the ISS when it comes, you can see the azimuth I have, and that's the degrees, so, and I've actually explained this pretty in, a, in pretty good detail on a previous video, and I'll link that from here so you can watch that if you want to get a more detailed explanation of how I do that. But basically, I, I, I use the compass to figure out the direction, and I find it, and I make a marker, and I say, okay, that's... That's where it's beginning, then I figure out max elevation, and that's where it's max elevation, then I figure out where it's ending. And, and this is actually where the pass came from. So that's that. Um, this is my recording setup. I have an audio recorder for the radio, and I've got um, a, an audio cable wired directly into the speaker of the radio. Um, and I do that because, and I'll finally be able to show this if I can get the radio out. So there's an external, see the jack down there is an external speaker connection. However, if you plug that in, if you plug anything in that, it cuts off the external speaker. And I like to be able to hear it a little bit or let other people hear it if they want to. So I basically wired an audio cable, uh, this audio cable here. I, audio, I wired that into the speaker terminals. Uh, there's definitely a better way to do that. 
um, probably wire them in before the amplifier stage for the speaker, but I didn't know how to do that, <laughs> so I haven't done that. And so that records the audio from the radio. This is my uh, another recorder I have hooked up to this microphone with a windscreen. They call this like a bunny tail or a squirrel tail or something like that. And the microphone is powered and it doesn't block the wind as well as I want to, so I'm going to have to get a bigger one, a better one for that. The, ba the radio is powered by a, a sealed lead acid battery and that's that. That's I think they, um, golf carts use sealed lead acid batteries if I remember correctly. A lot of things use them. Um, and then I have my, my headphones and I use that because I can hear the, the recording or the, um, the ISS a lot better than if I just listen to the speaker. I don't have to worry about background noise. I can hear the subtleties of the signal and I can adjust the antenna to, to get the signal better as I hear it fade in and out. Um, one thing you might have noticed in the very beginning of the transmission very, In the very beginning of the transmission I had the antenna one way polarized I had it I think I had it vertically polarized and that means the elements um, Are up and down and I turned the antenna 90 degrees at one point and the signal came in perfectly and that's because The signal actually changes polarization the, the radio waves change so if they're going up and down vertically like this Sometimes they'll change because as they come through the atmosphere, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but basically the atmosphere causes the, um, the radio energy to switch polarization. And, and that's it. I'm going to have to wrap it up because i got to go. So um, thank you for watching. This is John Breyer, KG4AKV73. Have a great day. Bye.